Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome here in the first regular session about CSS3, Learn to Love CSS3. Um, I'm going to talk to you about when and where to use CSS3. Um, I'm going to give you some examples, uh, but first, there's a little uh, history lesson about CSS. Uh, where is it coming from and how did we get to CSS3? Um, it all started in 1993. That's almost 20 years ago. Um, it, the, it's not necessarily that the CSS started them, but they were talking about style sheets. Because uh, Robert Reich, he proposed the name style sheets in 1993. As you can see, it looks a little bit harder than the CSS we know today. And I'm very happy that in 1994, these two guys um, started working together on creating CSS1. This is what CSS1 looks, uh, looked when it was in development. As you can see, it looks quite a lot like it looks today, except for uh, this part, maybe. Um, took them two years, and then in 1996, um, the CSS1 was recommended by the W3C. Then only two years later, uh, later CSS2 was recommended by the W3C. And then one year later, in 1999, CSS3 was mentioned for the first time. That's quite some years ago. 1999, yeah. Um, but why did it take so long for all the browsers to implement CSS3? Uh, why do we only start using it right now? That's because um, some browsers had a little more problems with implementing CSS 2.1. I'm not calling names, but some people just, uh, some browsers have more problems than other browsers. Um, now they finally uh, supported, it, supported it, and now we are ready for CSS 3. Um, using CSS 3, we can use it today. Um, CSS 3 is, is built, uh, it, it's, it consists out of modules. So we don't necessarily can use everything right now, but we can use certain modules because a lot of browsers are supporting those, uh, those modules right now. Uh, but where and when can we use CSS3? Because not everything is working. Um, we can use it on the critical layers. So don't use it on branding. Uh, if you got a, a super nice logo, don't animate it with CSS3 or use RGBA colors because all the browsers won't see your logo, which is, I think it's really uh, important that they see your logo, even if they're on all their browser. Uh, don't use it on layout. Um, there's a lot of cool properties uh, which we can use in CSS3 to make the layout, uh, layouting uh, a lot easier for us, a lot better. Uh, but if you do this, then your website will fall apart on the older browsers, the browsers that don't support the CSS3. So don't use that unless you, you use a really good fallback and you make sure that it works on the, uh, on the older browsers. And don't use it on usability because people should be able to use your website. Uh, for example, if you got a web form and you don't use a, uh, you use a white background and then a white input for field, and if you don't use a, a border, but just a little box shadow to, to make it look like a border, then on the older browsers you won't see anything because it's a white background with a white input field without the box shadow. So don't use it on, uh, on forms and usability. Um, always progressively enhance. I just said it before, make sure the website works in the older browsers. Always make sure um, that what you're doing is also viewable on the other browsers. It doesn't necessarily have to look the same, but people should be able to 
uh, to read and to use the website uh, when they are on all the browser. But it can look different, that's no problem to me at least. Um, and there's some performance problems. Um, for example, if you use uh, box shadows or text shadows on a lot of elements and on large elements, uh, then your website will get slower. Uh, there's a lot of great examples out there today, uh, websites uh, made with HTML5, CSS3, JavaScript, and uh, they are, they've got really much uh, HTML5 and CSS3, they're using really much of it. And if you look at those websites on, on, on a slower computer, you can really see that it's, that it's laggy. So watch out uh, where you use it because it can really uh, make your website a little bit slower. And that's something we don't want. Um, then I'll give you some, uh, some examples uh, now. I'm going to start with RGBA because I will use the RGBA in my other examples as well. So I'll just uh, do this first. Uh, you can use RGBA from Mozilla 3.0, uh, all Chrome versions. You've got Safari 3.0, Opera, um, Internet Explorer 9, Mobile Safari. And it works on colors, borders, and backgrounds. And we're going to start with the color first. Always put a regular standard color, hex color first for the older browsers. Um, an older browser will read this and they say, okay, the color is black. Um, then we define the color again with RGBA, uh, which is red, green, blue, and then the A is for alpha channel. And I said, uh, I want zero, zero red, zero green, and zero blue, and then a 100% alpha channel. So as you can see on the result on the right, it's the same because it's just black with 100% uh, alpha. Uh, then in the second example, it's, it's a little bit light in this room, so it's a little bit hard to see, but um, there I created a red. A 255 is the maximum amount for uh, the red, the greens, or the blue. And then for the alpha channel, the, it goes from, from zero to one. So I chose a 0.5 now, which is the same as 50%. As you can see on the older browsers, it's, it's just red or maybe black from this view, but it's actually red. Um, and then we've got a 50% alpha uh, red on the newer browsers, which support CSS3. Um, and then another example with another color uh, to show the different values for the RGBA. I said we've got this for color, uh, for um, borders and backgrounds, so now we're going to look at the uh, background. Another two um, examples, which is really hard to see in, in, the, in the top example, because it's actually it's 80%. <laughs> I put an image on the background to, to show you uh, what the alpha level does, instead of just a white background. Um, and as you can see in the second example, I used um, 255 for everything, which creates a white, and then a 25% alpha channel uh, to show you the difference between the older browsers and the newer browsers. And then also with, um, with another, another color right there. And then it's also usable on borders. Oh, you can't see this at all. I'm happy I got three examples. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a 30% black border, but you can't see it. Um, as you can see in the second example, it's actually the same. There's no difference between the older and the newer browsers. And that's because I've, um, I've put the RGBA property first. Uh, I just made the CSS. I went to my browser, uh, made a screenshot, and then looked at the color it was creating. Because it's a 50% wide border which um, if you look at it in your browser, it gives you this color. So I just got that color and put that color in first. So the older browsers have the, the, the same color eventually when they look at the website. The only thing is when I change this 50% uh, to, uh, to say 25%, the colors are not right anymore. But at least it's better than, than just a white border around it. So. Um, 
And then I've got an example with a background image. Um, doesn't work quite that well. It's a little bit hard to see, but actually the only part where it's working is in the bottom, because there the image shines through. And in the, the left and the right and the top border, it just gets uh, another part of the image and then it places the, uh, the black um, border above it. So I wouldn't recommend using um, transparent borders with images at the same time yet. Um, the borders use the, uh, the color of the, of the element. Uh, the box model says that the, the border should be outside of the, uh, of the element. But if you use a transparent border, it, it uses the background color of the element itself. So uh, it never uses the color of the background surrounding by it. If you want that, you need to uh, create another element with another color around it. Um, then something more fun, um, which are text shadows. They are used a lot nowadays. Um, funny thing, uh, text shadows were introduced in CSS 2.0, but no browser implemented it, so they took it out in CSS 2 revision 1, which we all started using uh, the last years. Um, but now they picked it up again, um, except for Internet Explorer. Uh, it only works in Internet Explorer 10 and not in 9, which is a shame because everybody's using this and it doesn't work there. Um, a little example, um, try to create a pressed text what you do with a text shadow is you've got um, a value uh, going from left to right. In this case, I've got a one pixel, so that's a one pixel to the right. Then the top and the bottom. I've got a one pixel to the bottom. Uh, then the zero is the blur, so I've got no blur in this uh, first shadow. And then I took a co uh, picked a color. As you can see around here, the first uh, border is just a solid border. Then you can separate your values with commas, so you can get multiple shadows within one, uh, one line. Um, so I first took the one pixel uh, shadow and then the two pixel shadow. So this is two pixels to the left and two pixels to the top, and then with a one pixel blur uh, to give it a little, a little more depth. And that's why I used an RGBA. Uh, just 20% black to just make it look like it's uh, pressed in even more, as you can see here. Um, I wouldn't recommend using this on your body text, but maybe on headers it, it could be nice. Uh, if you use it on your body text, it will be a very slow website, I think. Uh, another nice example which you can do with your shadows is um, creating something like a 3D text. And what I did here is I didn't go to the left or the right in any of those uh, values. I just went down from one to two, three, four pixels to the bottom. And I took a slightly darker color every time to uh, make it look like it's 3D. And then I ended up with, uh, with uh, two darker shadows to make it look like it's actually laying on there. It's actually uh, on the piece of, of paper, for example. So it's fun to do this. Um, in headers, you can uh, use it nicely. And then there's, of course, always the, uh, the flaming example. This is the one from uh, CSS3.info. It's always funny. I wouldn't recommend using this in your website if you want to look professional, but still, it's fun. Uh, <laughs> uh, depends on what kind of website you got, I think. <laughs> yeah. If you've got a website about stoves, you could use it maybe. but. Not for the most, I think. Um, you can also use shadows not only on text but also on, uh, on, on elements, on boxes. Um, but then you need a box shadow. As you can see, there's also a WebKit box shadow and a Moss box shadow. Um, and the dots should be, of course, replaced with the thing you want to show. Uh, these are fender prefixes. Why are they there? Um, as I said before, CSS3 is built out of modules, and uh, all the browsers could just uh, put their own vendor prefix, prefix in front of the, uh, of the value to test around with it. Um, so there, there are some properties that um, browsers used. I will show you that later with the gradients. Uh, WebKit, for example, used another uh, way of showing the gradients than, than the, uh, 
than all the other browsers and eventually they lost and now they also use the other one. This is just a way for browsers to test with it. You should always put them first and end with the actual uh, box shadow you want to show because your CSS will always look at the last uh, defined property. Um, the, it's, it's actually the same as the text shadow as, as in how it works. Uh, you just got five pixels to the right and then five pixels to the bottom. If you, uh, if you want it to the, to the left and the top, you just put a minus sign before it. And then there's a 30% 30, 30 black. Uh, just gives you a simple, simple border, uh, simple box shadow. But it's, uh, uh, it's better than doing this in Photoshop and saving your images and all stuff like that. Then you can use your box shadow not only, only to create shadows, but also to make things look like they're glowing, for example. That's what I did here. By just using um, a zero to the left or right and the bottom top, um, which makes sure that the shadow is right behind the element. But if you use a one pixel blur, it will go that one pixel to the outside, which shows a little black, um, black border there. And then I create another one, a 15 pixel white uh, shadow, which makes it look like it's, it's, uh, it's glowing. So you can use the debug shadow or the text shadow for other things than just uh, shadows. You can use it for those kind of things as well. Um, and you can do all, all kinds of stuff with it. It looks a little bit difficult, but I want to show you two things about this. Um, the first one is the inset. Uh, it, it tells um, a CSS, the browser, not to put the shadow outside of the box, just, but just inside of the box, so you can have an inset uh, shadow. As you can see here, uh, I created a white uh, inside, inset uh, shadow and then a black one um, inside. So it's, uh, it's good to use it inside as well. And the other thing I want to show you about this is the, uh, is the minus 10 pixels there. And that's the spread of the, of the box shadow. So what I did is I, uh, I made the spread 10 pixels smaller than it's, it, it should be, which shows you that the uh, shadow doesn't uh, go, go until the end, but it stops 10 pixels within the, in the element. So you can create a, a nicer shadow that way. You have to make sure that these two values are high enough if you want to use something like that, because uh, if you make those two five and you uh, make the spread uh, minus 10 pixels, it will just disappear behind the element. So if it's not working, it's not necessarily not working, but your values could be too low. Um, then something else that people use a lot these days is uh, rounded corners, of course. This is just a simple example, uh, again with the WebKit and the Mozilla prefixes. Uh, that's the only ones you, uh, those are the only ones you need for this. Um, this is just a simple 20 pixel border radius, which gives you a 20 pixel border radius. Um, but you can also do other things with it, like creating circles. What I did here is I created an, an, an element which is 200 pixels wide and 200 pixels high. And then just a border radius of uh, 9,999, uh, which makes sure it's always a circle. So if you want to create a larger or a smaller circle, you only have to change those two values. Um, you could place a lower a value there too, uh, the right value. I think it will be 100 pixels then. But if you want to change the, the size of the circle, you have to change that as well. So it's easier to, to just uh, put a really high value there and uh, change the circles in that way. Um, on all the browsers, this will just be a square, so be aware of that. A question, yeah? What about the dots? Though? Sorry? The dots uh, instead of the... <laughs> you forgot something? Those dots. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, though we have to put the 999, 9, there too as well, but I'm not going to put that there every time because uh, in the, the other example for the gradients, it will be too much for on one sheet. So the dot should be replaced with the actual value, as I mentioned before. Yeah, you were busy in your laptop. Okay, so um, you don't have to necessarily use the same border radius on every corner. You can use different ones on every corner. Um, here I use a shorthand of 20 pixels and 60 pixels. 
which basically says that the top left and the bottom right should be 20 and the, the other one should be 60. Uh, if you want to use different ones for every corner, uh, it's always the top left, top right, bottom right, and then the left, bottom, left, bottom, yeah. So that's the, the way it goes. Then, uh, we are here with the gradients and they look a little daunting, but um, I actually never create those because there are uh, very great CSS3 <laughs> gradient creators which do the work for you. Um, and it doesn't stop with going from one color to, to another, but you can make several, use several stops in there as well and radial gradients and everything. Um, if, you want to use, if you want to do this yourself, it's a lot of work and a mistake is easy made because if you really want, it, really want to be sure, you got to check it uh, every time again or, or even check, uh, check it on every single browser. So if you just let, uh, let the CSS3 cre a gradient creator do your work, that's, uh, it's easier for everybody. As I mentioned before, um, the WebKit had a, a, another, a different way of doing this uh, a couple of years ago. Um, but they stopped from, where is it? Oh, until Safari 4 and Chrome 4. I'm not sure about this, but um, WebKit uses the, the other version as well from Safari 5.1 and Chrome 10 Plus. There, there it is. Um, so I personally don't use the older one anymore. The creator, the CSS3 grading creator gives me the, other, the old one as well, um, as well as a, a filter for uh, Internet Explorer. So it covers everything. Um, I personally just stopped using that um, because I don't really care about uh, the, the older browsers, just the WebKit and the, the, the Chrome and the Safari don't see a gradient, I just put a solid color there. Uh, as I mentioned here uh, on the bottom, you should always start with a solid color because um, the older browsers won't see the gradient. Uh, so at least give them something so they can read your text. I usually take the color in the middle or just another uh, color which uh, makes sure the text is, uh, is readable. It's good. Um, you can also combine the gradients with the RGBA and get some transparent gradients. And as you can see, if you are really closing, uh, looking closely, you can see that I used a background now instead of a background image. Because uh, the gradient is a background image now. I think it, it should be a background gradient and not a background image. I hope they are going to change that. Um, but it's an image now. Um, I used a uh, regular background here, and why did I do this? Um, you've got the image and then the uh, transparent gradient. If I, used a, uh, if I used an image here, then the browser would first give the element uh, the background color for the older browsers, uh, and then put the image on top of it. So it wouldn't be transparent anymore, it would just be uh, the solid color to uh, to what I want it to be. And I've got another example to make that a little bit clearer. I've got a background color of red here. And then I did use the, um, the image, which is exactly the same, uh, it's, it's the same gradient as the, as the sheet before. Uh, but now you can see that the background is actually red and it's going to blue, which you can also use very well. Because if, um, if a colleague, your boss or your client uh, wants a gradient from, from red to blue, and then next week he changes his mind and he wants a gradient from, from brown to blue, all you have to do is change the red to brown and it will work everywhere without having to uh, go to your CSS gradient creator and do it all again. So it's, uh, it's actually uh, a good way to make use of this. Yeah, uh, then we've got um, multiple backgrounds and they are really nice as well. Um, I'll walk you through. Um, I first used this white uh, triangular image and I repeated it. You can separate backgrounds now with a comma. So then I put another, uh, the wood pattern in. 
and you can even combine the multiple background images with the with the gradients also just separate it with a comma what I did here is I created a gradient 50% black to to 0% nothing so you just get a subtle, uh, subtle gradient there um, as you can see I put the background color separate that's because it doesn't work uh, when you use multiple images combined with uh, gradients then you can put the color on the same line and it will show you nothing so you have to uh, define it separately which is fine because you can create uh, you can change the color uh, easily if you want another color uh, great to use um, but the other browsers don't see it so you always got to start with um, a background uh, a regular background for the older browsers what you could do is create this and make a screenshot uh, get a little uh, part of it and just m use that as a background so that the older browsers will almost see see the same um, but don't use it if it's very important if you if you got Im important uh, information in this white top bar then the older browsers won't even be able to read that at all so watch out what you're doing and always check in the, in the other older browsers as well and then there's two uh, fun things they are there for about five years now uh, not a lot of people know about it I believe um, it's a word wrap and a text overflow two nice uh, little features um, you got the um, the word wrap would just break your words when you use break word um, which is really handy in, in, in blog posts if you got uh, your most popular blogs and some of those blogs have really long words in it and your column is just uh, too small for that it will just um, as you can see with the NDR uh, it will ignore the padding and the size and it will just put the word there well if you use break word it will break the word and it will flow uh, flow nicely the only downside is that it doesn't um, recognize language or words but it just breaks at the width of the element so it do doesn't put the dashes in and it doesn't break uh, break nicely it just breaks when the when the width is uh, is gone so that's something you should consider it could give you some really weird words if you don't watch out for that um, another thing you could use in those uh, uh, popular blogs for example is uh, is the text overflow and these uh, three dots are created with CSS and nothing else um, which is also really nice because if you just want one line in your favorite blogs or most read blogs uh, you can just put them all uh, uh, below under each other just use the dots to uh, to make the line short um, but in the code it's there uh, the whole blog title is there in your HTML uh, if you use overflow visible then the text will be visible again for your users so if they want to click it they get the, f the, the full title first so this is a, this is a nice feature um, won't really work on our devices so you got to do something for that separate as well then if you want to use that which browsers does it work on to be specific this yeah. uh, can really tell I'm not really sure about that um, there's going to be a sheet at the end with some useful websites and if you want to use this you can just put it in there and you can find it but it's uh, it's, it's been there for from 2000, 2007 so I think a lot of browsers are supporting this oh, then there's uh, three nice things uh, transitions transforms and animations um, I'm not going to talk uh, too much about it because it's uh, um, a little hard um, first you need the vendor prefixes for all the major browsers so we, we, you need the WebKit, the Mozilla, Microsoft and the Opera uh, prefix always put them first and end with, uh, with the, the normal, the regular one what I did here is I created an object which is white with a black, uh, black text on it and then I want to uh, change the background and the color in half a second with an ease and out easing um, to change but when do I want to do this I want to do this when I'm hovering but I should put the transition not in the hover state but in the regular state which was a little weird for me at first um, 
but you gotta put it there, and once you hover, then it uh, activates the, uh, the transition. Um, not everything can be put in, into these transitions. Uh, you got background and color and a few other properties, but not everything works. Uh, so watch out with that. Um, you can all define them separately, but what I always like to do is just put an all there, because it looks really weird if you have an object with a transition and half of the properties are uh, are flowing uh, fluidly and take half a second, and other things are just bam are right there. For example, if I change only the the background here. Um, and I change the color too, but I don't put the color in the transition, then the first thing you see is a white text on a white block, and then suddenly it, it goes uh, to black smoothly. I have an example if it's working. It's not working. Hmm? We can still try. It's not working. Shit. <laughs> I was prepared with my own laptop, but now I've got Theo's one, so it's not working. PowerPoint is is converting your videos to images every time you close PowerPoint. It's really weird, I don't know why. I gotta look this up. But. Um, okay, so it's not working. You can see it later if you want. Then we've got the transforms, which are cool to use, but, um, but only use them on image, gal image galleries or things like that. Or maybe some labels or things that are not so important because um, it's not supported very well, um, so I would I would wait with this a little longer to use it site wide uh, for everything. Um, you got a few different things. You got a rotate, and the first image is rotated with five degrees, so it's just a simple rotate. You got skew uh, and scale, a rotate, and a translate, which is uh, just uh, the x and the y border. You just uh, move the position. Uh, from the element. As I said, fun to use in, in image galleries um, combined with transitions. If you hover them and they get a little bigger and they slightly get a, rotate a little bit. And you also need the, um, all the vendor prefixes for this. It's nice to use. It's not that hard. It's really uh, simple to use. Uh, what a little bit harder is our animations. Um, I'll try to explain it to you. Um, there are two steps involved when you want to use an animation. Um, animation should be used if you want to, uh, to animate an object with several steps. Most of the animations you want to do could actually be done with uh, transitions, because it's just from, from point A to B, a simple transition, just a change of color. You don't need an animation for that, just use a transition for that. But if you, if you want uh, several steps, as I got here, I got three steps, then you should use an animation. Um, so what do you do? You say um, add keyframes and then uh, animate, but you can give this any name you want. If you want to put your own name there, that's, that's all right. Uh, choose a proper name for the animation that you are going to use. The way to use the fender prefixes is first the add, and then the fender prefixes, then the keyframe. Um, and the next thing you do is you define the different stages. So you start with the 0%, and you've got an element which is 300 pixels wide and um, 100 high. Uh, at 25%, you make that box twice as large, and I flip the, uh, flip the background and the, and the color, which I can't show you in the movie later. Uh, and then at 100%, I changed it back to what it was before. So what this box would do is just uh, get big really fast and change the colors, and then takes 75% uh, to go back to its regular state. Um, if you got this in your CSS, it doesn't do anything yet, because you only created the animation right now. If you want to use it, you've got to um, do it like this, for example. Um, I use it on hover. So what, what you do then is you say uh, the animation, I want to do an animation. The, the animation I want to do is the animate, uh, and that's, that's the thing you could use your own name for or something else. So you can have multiple animations within your CSS files. You just call the animation you just made, you define uh, what, uh, how long it should take to, to run the animation. 
So you can have the same animation on your website and you can use it uh, on one part and it takes only one second and you can use the exact same animation you created on another part of your website which takes 10 seconds. So that's, that's uh, nice that you can do define that afterwards. And then you can say how many times it should run. Uh, it can run one time or it can run six times or it can run infinite. And I will just uh, continue as I can't show you. But the box will get larger and smaller and you get No, it's, it's, it's going to 100 and then just starts over again. That's why I've uh, created this 100%, which is the same as the, as the first key, so it actually goes smoothly. Um, yeah. So you could uh, define um, from 1 to 100% different states. Uh, yeah, you can put uh, 100 states in there if you want. Okay. Yeah. So it's a little bit crazy, but <laughs> you can do that, yeah. Just as much as you want, yeah. Um, then I want to uh, tell you something, uh, not so much, but a little, things, a little thing about um, the CSS3 selectors, because we've got great selectors now, which we can't really use because all the other browsers don't, they don't, um, they're not viewing it rightly. Um, but I want to show you some, because it's nice. Uh, if you've got a table and you want to have zebra lines, just uh, the, f the first and the third and the fifth line, you want a uh, simple gray, for example. Uh, if we wanted to do that last year, uh, we needed to uh, put some JavaScript in and just give them some classes then in your CSS and uh, give the class, uh, the, the odd classes, for example, um, a light gray color. We can now use the NTH child and just put out there and give it another color. And as you can see, all the odd lines get a light gray background. It's way easier than having to use JavaScript and CSS at the same time. Plus, it's, this works everywhere, even when your JavaScript is, uh, is not enabled. Um, you can use odd and even in the uh, NTH child, and you can use a lot more. For example, you can use five there, and it just gets the fifth element. In this case, the fifth uh, table row, and I made it yellow. Um, so you can you can put a, a one or two or whatever you can you can put lots of things in there. You can also do some calculations with it. Um, I'm not going to show you right now because it's a little complicated. Um, I can tell you later if you want. But you can you can use all kinds of calculations to um, target every fifth line. So it, then it takes the fifth, the tenth, the fifteenth, the twentieth. And you can uh, do all kinds of stuff uh, with that too. Uh, there's also two fun new um, selectors, which is the first of type, which is actually a little bit the same like a first child. Um, as you can see, the first of type, I made a, uh, a light blue here. But the first of type and the first child and the last of type and last child, as I uh, show you here, just lose, use the last child. It, it actually does the same. Uh, what's the difference uh, with a first of type and a last of type? You can uh, also do some calculations. So you can start from the back and then do some stuff with that. So that's, uh, that's great to use. And last and first child are just the first and the last child. You can do anything with it. Um, I had an, a video example here, which is not working with animations and transitions and everything in it. Uh, so you can look at this for a while and imagine what it could do. So, so much fun. Isn't it great? Yeah, it's not working there either. Hmm? Oh, yeah. Well, I'll show it later if you want to. Later. Uh, as promised, some useful websites because you don't have to remember everything or put everything on your laptop or iPad. Um, here they are. We got CSS3 info with a lot of information about CSS3, of course. Um, then there's uh, HTML5, please. Um, that's the one I uh, told you about just now. If you want uh, to use something, what HTML5, please, is, is actually a website with one search bar on it. Um, and if you want to use a CSS3 property, you just put it in there, and it immediately, immediately gives you the answer if, whether you can use it or not. 
whether you need some polyfills or fallbacks, uh, which browsers uh, support the feature you want to use. So it's really handy if you want to use something and you're not sure whether which uh, vendor prefixes you need or if it's working at all, use that website. Uh, then there's CSS3, please, and you can just, um, it's got uh, a lot of CSS3 properties on this website, which you can play with. Uh, just like on JS Fiddle, for example, you can just uh, immediately start checking out the CSS3 features. So you don't have to set up your own test website to test with the features. You can just go there and do it online. It's, uh, it's really easy. Um, this is a gradient creator. There are a lot of them. Uh, I use Colorzilla in my Chrome to, uh, uh, for, for, for picking colors. And it's also got the gradient creator. So I, I just use that there as well. And then there's all these CSS3 selectors on the, on the w3.org website. Um, fun to look around and, and see the possibilities, what you can do with it. Um, I said a lot today. Um, I'm sure there's some questions. Who got the first question for me? Yeah? We think rows of tables. You showed us that the CSS yeah. referred to row 5. Yeah. Can the reference be to not a number but a variable? Um, so yeah. And in this particular circumstance, you'd like to highlight this line, mm -hmm. but in some different circumstance, you'd like to highlight some other line. Yeah, exactly. So you want to check uh, for a class or, or a value within the row, something like that. Yeah. I'm not really sure about that. There's a lot of things possible with the CSS3 selectors, so it might be possible. I'll look into it because uh, it, it would be great to use. I know that there's a CSS3 selector which is not. It's, it's just uh, uh, two dots and then not. And then you can put a, a class or, or something in there, for example. So it is possible with the CSS3 selectors. I'm not sure uh, whether it can be used with all the CSS3 selectors. But it's, it is possible. Any other questions? No more questions. All right. If I want to leave you today with a few things, those are these. If you want to use CSS3, just go and start using it today. But do be careful where to use it, because it's not working everywhere. So um, progressively enhance. So always make sure that it works. Uh, it, it doesn't look the same everywhere, but at least the content you are showing on your website is viewable by everybody. So make sure that the older browsers the, uh, who don't support CSS3 will see something. Always put your users first. It's very important. You can have a great website, but if the users can use it, what's the point of the whole website anyway? <laughs> and don't let it take over. Um, there was a few years ago when JavaScript was introduced, there was all the words and snickers flying around behind your cursor. Don't, don't let it take over. Don't animate the whole website. Just use it subtle and, uh, and make your websites nicer, nicer and not stupid. That's it. Thank you. <laughs>